Hello, uh, this is part of the OCT Sat channel series of presentations. Um, it was clear that this brief presentation needed to be added uh, based on some questions that were raised on the, the other videos. So what is optical coherence tomography and why should you care? And I'm going to differentiate between its use in transparent and non-transparent tissue, which is very different. And the history of LCI and its later name, OCT, are covered in another video on the channel, or two of them, in great detail. And I'm not going to shoot for historical accuracy here. It is a strange situation because um, practitioners are either thinking, I have no clue what OCT is, or why are you asking me? I use it every day. So roughly OCT is imaging at the level of a biopsy without uh, tissue removal and it's performed at video rate. It's using infrared light. It is FDA approved and in use uh, to varying degrees in fields including ophthalmology, cardiology. There's more on this list than this list is not. Uh, uh, there's others than those on this list and even in the application, the areas on this list, the number of applications are going to continue to expand. My name is Mark Brzezinski. I added this because why should I be talking about OCT? Uh, uh, along with James Fujimoto on our team, in the early 1990s, we uh, were able to get OCT to work in non-transparent tissue, so we, which is most of the tissue of the body. Light obviously works in transparent tissue. It's hard to get it to image in non-transparent tissue. I started the programs, OCT programs at Harvard, MGH and Brigham and Women's, co-founded Light Lab Imaging, uh, and won presidential award uh, from President Clinton for OCT. Um, I also uh, divide my time between science and being an inpatient physician. And I want to point out, because this is rarely pointed out, imaging in transparent and non-transparent tissue are two different entities. Transparent tissue followed up to a large degree telecommunication, which is covered in the history of OCT. Um, the work in non-transparent tissue was hypothesis driven. Uh, so now that's not to say the it, the work in transparent tissue isn't critical. It's made a dramatic difference in the eye, and um, it extended over several decades, but it was spearheaded uh, engineering-wise by James Fujimoto and clinically by the Tufts group. This is an image of the retina on top showing the layers within the retina. It's been a powerful tool for managing, for instance, macular degeneration, but we were surprised when it became an important tool in neurology. You're looking at a nerve layer and, for example, following disorders like MS. Now on the bottom, it also images in non-transparent tissue. The image all the way to the left on the bottom obviously isn't an OCT image, it's an angiogram. The little whitish yellow arrow um, is where a thin cap fiber atheroma or vulnerable plaque is and uh, you can't see it on the angiogram. The only technology that really can pick up these things is OCT. If we go to the middle image it shows a ruptured TCFA and the relationship between TCFAs and heart attacks is discussed in other videos but what happened is the stent strut um, in figure two when a stent was placed here it broke the TCFA and led to a clot formation. So now, the next four slides are funny because they're the same slides we used in the 1990s because you don't do a lot of these basic talks anymore. Um, OCT is analogous to ultrasound measuring. The intensity of back reflected infrared light rather than acoustical waves. Not entirely accurate, but it works. Low coherent light or, or infrared light pulses are generated at the sample. 
the time for light to be reflected back gives you distances and the intensity of back reflection is plotted as a function of depth analogous to ultrasound and it's called LCI when it's in one dimension and when it's done in two dimensions it's developed the name optical coherence tomography which is shown on the right now due to the high speed associated with the propagation of life light the echo delay time cannot be measured electronically and we said for so many years it's on the slide therefore the technique of low coherent interferometry is used L low coherent er low coherence interferometry is actually sort of the real name for OCT it is low coherence infer interferometry so this is somewhat I don't know why we say it but low co in low coherence interferometry because you can't measure like you can with ultrasound the time something goes and comes back again like to moves too fast you use a reference arm and the physics of this is discussed in the lecture on axial resolution but what I want to point out is in the sample arm there's a microscope but this could be an endoscope and because of the fact uh, we're using fiber optics though a non-transparent tissue we're using unusual fiber optics uh, it's very small so the catheters can be engineered um, around the fiber optic where the that is 120 microns in diameter and can be brought down to 80 and the core on that fiber is only 8 to 9 microns it, its resolution advantage is, is the key it, it says here 1 to 20 microns but you can get better than 1 micron and people have and uh, the typical clinical resolution used is 10 to 20 microns and the reason for that is covered in the lateral resolution lecture it's real time catheters are very tiny we're going to publish a study where we went in and looked in knee joints through a it was either an 18 or 20 gauge knee a spinal needle um, it's compact and portable at this point you can make it the size of a defibrillator and w there are adjuvant techniques which I'll discuss at the end so this is what OCT looked like in the 1990s we produced great images but I don't think people would have been as enthusiastic if they actually had seen it and we developed light lab imaging this is one of my OCT systems uh, this is the a light lab system but now they are even more complex packed and again the catheters are very tiny for people unfamiliar that loop is the plastic you hold catheters in to keep them sterile and compact and, and prevent damage so this is an image from within a coronary uh, the center area is the lumen with the uh, dropout area being the catheter and within the tissue you see b bright ref reflections circling that's a stent in a coronary artery and then intima grew over it so that stent was placed months to a year at least after um, the uh, and this image was performed uh, this is not right after a stent placement so one of the areas for OCT obviously is in guiding stent placement a uh, source of another discussion and the other is in identifying and treating the plaques that cause heart attacks and they're the ones with necrotic cores and again we've covered this in other presentations and the, if we look to the left of this image from 8 o'clock to 12 o'clock we have a thin intima over a necrotic core so when do we use OCT um, we had published this I, I don't know why it's a long time ago in 1999 in uh, IEEE quantum electronics which is a strange place to publish it and we were right with a few exceptions that I'll point out as to where it could be useful and then it was later reproduced 
the next year in neoplasia, which is the one that usually gets cited. But um, OCT is when biopsy is hazardous, so the eye would be one, and that's a transparent issue. Brain, cartilage, and coronary. Uh, when sampling is an issue, um, when there's a chance for sampling error, like the cervix, and we're interested in a cervical OCT system for third world countries and Barrett's esophagus, and there's a ton of literature on this now. I believe it will be the technology of choice for Barrett's um, and guiding microsurgery. We're, you know, we're connecting nerves, repairing fallopian tubes, uh, vascular grafts, skin grafts. Uh, there are a couple areas we didn't think of. T tissue engineering, it's shown an important role. Uh, the fact that it's used by neurology and ophthalmology, that we didn't really predict either. So adjuvant techniques. Um, there's a bunch of them. And after 2000, so OC, we got... Uh, and our group, I, I'm saying we or I a lot, but the period um, between 1993 and 2000, it was predominantly our team that got it to work in non-transparent tissue to the point of in vivo human um, studies. And after 2000, spent a lot of time working on adjuvant techniques, though I want to point out other groups have been working on these techniques to some a lot more than we have. Uh, we've spent a lot of time on polarization sensitive OCT which detects collagen organization. Spectroscopic OCT which has been attempted to use for lipid by our group and other groups. Elastography, uh, uh, tensile strength, a very important modality and I'm not, these are all going to be explained separately in other videos. Photon tagging, you use an ultrasound beam you can, from even outside the body to interact with the photon, OCT photon, when it's in tissue and it gives you information about the tissue. Again, another lecture. Second order correlation spectroscopy isn't an OCT technique. That's an area I've, my team has been working on for a decade. Um, it uses quantum thermal second order correlations, which is considered noise in the OCT system. And um, Doppler OCT, which we personally have done very little work on. A and this is just one example. So polarization sensitive OCT in, in cartilage is more effective than structural imaging with OCT and we've done this enough in humans already that the orthopedic surgeons and perhaps the interventional radiologists will also uh, favor using PSOCT. So in the bottom left um, we see a nice banding pattern. Healthy cartilage has well organized collagen and that banding pattern is caused by well, well organized collagen. In the upper right um, upper left, sorry, we see collagen becoming a little bit disorganized, even though the slide says normal. Uh, and collagen changes far precede changes in cartilage thickness or anything you would detect on MRI. And then the right just shows severely diseased. And this was done in vivo in human joints. So what has happened since 2000. It's almost as if, with the exception of ophthalmology, the technology has gone to a, in my opinion, a grinding halt. This and cardiology is a great example for a technology that is so effective. Why is it underutilized? And I'm going to deal with this in a separate presentation. So OCT is a powerful technology and it will continue to expand. Some of us who were enthusiastic over the speed reached by 2000 are somewhat disappointed or disillusioned by 
to slow down between 2000 and 2020, but it will get there. And then I want to point out, I, I, I point out we had a pretty dominant role in the 1990s, but it wasn't, Jim Fujimoto and I, uh, who have worked together and have been friends for, you know, like over like 25 years, which is amazing in and of itself, were PIs, but the level of talent we had to get to move so quickly is amazing, was amazing if we look back at it. And a lot of the, if you look at a lot of these students' postdocs, they're full professors or have uh, endowed chaired at this point, Gary Turney, Brett Boma, Stephen Bopart, you go down the list, David Hong's not on that list, outstanding collaborators, even the technicians went on to have successful careers. And these are, this is some of our funding. We were heavily funded by the NIH and then some separate sources, including um, the medical division of the military. Thank you very much.